Welcome to the Peaceful Power Podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Clausen. And today I have Amrita Madeve on, and she's an Ayurvedic practitioner, health coach, author, and on a mission to empower women to wake up and go into birthing self-love through holistic health and self-care. For the past decade, Amrita has been a holistic chef in retreats and conscious eating coach, empowering individuals to make healthier choices. So welcome to the show this morning or afternoon for you. (laughs) Yeah, great to meet you from Mallorca, Spain. Yes, I love it. Well, I would love to kind of start, I, anyone who's into Ayurveda or an Ayurvedic practitioner, I like to know, how did you first discover Ayurveda and how did it enter your life? Yes, as, um, as a gentle whisper, it started from the age of like 20. I went to India with my dad to an ashram and um, there, there were, they have a clinic that was attached to the ashram which was also about Ayurveda and my life in my life, I've always been called to be of service through health and nutrition Mm. and just seeing that, that work going around to the tribal people's homes in India and, you know, seeing how herbs were used and how oils were used. It was pretty, I don't know, it was kind of like a remembering for me Uh, because I was also brought up in um, an area of London where there was a large diaspora of Asian Indians and it also was something that we had in our homes where these, you know, interesting smelling oils that my nan would have and and different herbs and spices it was always kind of part of my life and then when um i came back to london it just kept on coming into my life kept on reappearing like you know the people that were coming to my studio um were either doing like you know kundalini yoga they were all yoginis and um very close to me a local like whole food shop there was also a specialist in there that was ayurveda um, trained and she was you know telling me my constitution and so it was kind of like always just seeping through into my life beautiful well our topic today um i wanted to kind of dive into is the nervous system in Ayurveda. And so for anyone kind of listening, this is a topic that I haven't talked about a ton and I'm really excited to, um, you know, discuss this with you. And when I threw out the invite, I just kind of asked Amrita, what does she want to talk about? And she came back with the nervous system and I'm like, well, this is totally kismet. Like, how did we (laughs) both, I needed this topic and you want to talk about it. And so I want to start there kind of high level for this one. Um, Ayurveda and the nervous system. How does this work? I know you talk a lot about eating and nutrition, so I would love if you can incorporate some of that, maybe gut health into this topic as well. Absolutely. Well, yeah, let's dive right in. I mean, there's a proverb that says, you know, the mind is more in the body than the body is more in the mind. And this describes the five senses where we're seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, and tasting so we explore the world around us and therefore it informs the body with stimuli and motor responses and this is carried by the maja datu and that is one of the seven tissues spoken of in ayurveda which is the nerve tissue and so this nerve tissue is greatly affected, as you said rightly, by the gut and our food, and also it impacts the signs and symptoms up into the brain, because the Majadatu is connected to Pitta Sadaka, which is the gray matter of the brain. And so some of the symptoms that you kind of feel almost 
instantly when something is off with your gut and the brain is, you know, confusion, brain fog, tingling of the nerves and the hands and the feet, confusion. And, and that's because the nerve tissue is intimately connected with the brain. And we know also from modern science that the gut and the brain are connected. So what we're eating directly impacts the way that we are seeing the world, perceiving the world, experiencing the world. And so it all really comes back to, you know, are we nourishing ourselves with the foods that are going to be most beneficial for our digestion and for our body type? I want to pull that thread a little um, and talk about digestion and, you know, eating the foods that we can digest. And I feel like this is something that I talk about too in Ayurveda and maybe people, you know, miss that concept, but for us in Ayurveda, we're like, what we eat can be different depending on, Hey, can you digest it? So can you talk a little bit about, you know, maybe that, what does that look like? If someone's kind of like, I don't know if I'm actually digesting my food, how would they be able to tell, am I digesting quinoa? Am I digesting, you know, this veggie? Yeah. So some of the signs and symptoms of when you have poor digestion are, you know, the creation of amatoxins because the body's not breaking the food down. Um, and that, that could be for a number of reasons. It might be that you're overeating the portion amount. It might mean that you're eating at the wrong time of the day. It might mean that you're drinking your drink at the wrong time in the, in the digestive process. And so it's really about case per case, looking to see where exactly, you know, you are going wrong in the, in the process of digestion, because it is a really complex um, system that's beautifully broken down, I think in Ayurveda so that we can simply kind of see. And then as we know, in Ayurveda, we have the four types of digestive fire, the, the Agni, uh, which can be either variable, it could be very sharp and hyper mobile, it could be very sluggish and slow, or it could be just, you know, normal and fine. So understanding your type of digestive fire is really key to, to first of all, finding out if you're digesting things correctly, um, if you're eating the right foods for your digestion. And then obviously, you know, are you having burping? Is there gas? Is there bloating? You know, what, what's your body telling you when you eat that certain food? Is it coming out in the stool kind of undigested? These are some, some very kind of simple ways that we can just take a, a step back and tune in to listen to our bodies, which I think Ayurveda does so beautifully. It, it always turns us back to our awareness um, of where where we are and how we are at this moment in time. And how does that relate? This is something that I've seen. And I know you talk a lot about menstrual health as well and perimenopause and menopause. What about digestion slowing around certain times of the month? I know that can be a complaint, like sometimes around ovulation or right before people bleed, they tend to have maybe slower bowel movements, but the rest of the month, they're fine. Is that like an Apana Bayou issue or what would that, you know, kind of link to in your eyes? Yeah. So, so that is all to do with the hormone that uh, estrogen we need specifically when it comes to the cycle increasing at that time just before we receive our um, cycle so there is a as you know yourself there's many protocols of of just slowing down you know eating very simple foods before your menstrual cycle and and really kind of again like not 
using your energy too much for the external but kind of more going inwards um to to take care of this body take care of this vessel and allow those processes the the change of hormones to really you know take place and it's just like literally you know it well it changes for everyone but three days before those first three days of your menstrual cycle or it might be like a week before your menstrual cycle just starting to notice that there's a change in digestion maybe there's additional bloating and you can take teas that will help to enkindle your digestive fire so that you have an easier um you know digestive digestive process mm. yes one of my favorites is the adwan tea at that Ooh. time i don't know if i've ever had that one before ajwan seeds i have some ajwan seeds and i don't know if i've ever had them besides in one of my recipes so i'm gonna have to try that in a mm. tea i like that <laughs> <laughs> well i want to know about so as you're talking about that like that can also relate to like the nervous system and so when i see clients sometimes mm. they have trouble settling down so there's often those people who you know they can't slow down. They're just kind of maybe in the more Vata nature of just like the mm -hmm. speed up, speed up, speed up. They don't like that slowness and stillness or the Pitta mm -hmm. side where they like to be productive. They don't want to slow down because they just have so much to do. Would both of those things be related to, to nervous system imbalances and how can maybe in particular, like a Vata and Pitta maybe find their chill or calm during that stage? Yes, completely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, this is this is um, the modern way where I think that we've lost our way, <laughs> particularly. <laughs> I feel like we we've gone for that male domination, you know, um, and we need to bring back more of the feminine qualities. And and that doesn't mean that you're less productive. It just means that you notice the world around you and the beauty that you can create in the world from taking time for yourself to slow down and and being creative you know um and i think that you know certainly the clients that i work with they are looking for that in their lives they're looking for you know rewiring their nervous system and learning new ways of of being in this life and i feel that you know, we're ready for it as women to, to notice our power in the slowing down, you know, in the taking care of ourselves, in the nurturance of, you know, our environments and and to to bring in that feminine quality, because I think the planet Earth needs that. We need that more than ever um, so that we can feel something different, you know? Yes. Yeah. I mean, and that can be, that can be such a great, you know, medicine for so many of us, no matter mm. your dosha type of learning how to slow down. Mm. And, um, are there any practices mm. if I'm thinking about like, you know, I'm thinking of just even social media, it's so easy to be like, here's the quote tile. And this is where Ayurveda can be so hard to like put into social media because you can only, there's only mm. so much you can explain in little, and I'm sure you probably juggle this too, of like, there's so much more I could say on this. And there's so many, like, here's an asterisk because this might not pertain to you, even though the slide says it could, and, you know, all of those things. So if we're thinking about that and, you know, what are some practices that people could do, you know, to help calm the nervous system, if they're maybe having uh, fight or flight and they're constantly kind of in that fidgeting, I can't sit still, I, I gotta go, I gotta move. Uh, how mm -hmm. can maybe they calm their nervous system down a little? Yeah, so it all comes down to, you know, I think people seeing, if you're talking about like social media and Instagram, I think people that will see, you know, my wall, they say things like, oh, I just love seeing your posts because they've slowed me down, mm. you know? Um, it's it like makes me feel something different and I'm not doing it intentionally this is just how I live my life <laughs> and so you know I think that when you're ready for that then that kind of draws you in and I think that 
there are so many practices that Ayurveda offers that really it's about trying them for yourself and seeing what you enjoy doing you know what you can start to implement and it could be something very simple like walking in nature once a week it could be planting some herbs in a herb garden on your window ledge it could be um, doing some breath work and just sitting on your yoga mat and just doing a box breath where you allow yourself to slow down it could be smelling essential oils that make you feel nice and relaxed and expansive and then just allowing yourself to sit in that stillness um, which i call a sacred pause i just put a video up on my youtube channel which shares you know ways that we can kind of change our nervous system from one state the fight and flight into the other state and you can do it in seconds you know literally it doesn't take long for you to be able to take a breath and calm down make yourself a tea sit down get your journal out follow a prompt you know it's that simple it's just about making it a priority why am i doing this in this time and asking who is it that i want to be in this moment you know do i want to be a nervous wreck or do i want to be the calm woman that just feels really focused and centered and anchored into my womb space where i feel grounded and you know in this loving core where i know who i am you know or do i you know want to feel chaotic and and you know overwhelmed it's a choice and we get to make that choice at every moment it's um it's that kind of simple really yeah yeah um well if someone's listening and they're kind of thinking like oh i'm you know i maybe i've always battled anxiety and i'm always a bundle of stress do you think like these are some practices that would work for mm-hmm. those people who might be listening and saying Mm-hmm. one of my teachers, I guess, told me, and I don't, I'd be curious to see what you thought of this too, of, mm-hmm. you know, they said, whatever you tell yourself or stories you tell yourself. So like, I mm-hmm. always have anxiety. That's what your body clings to. They just, here's the anxiety yeah. and that further increases it. Um, and I've kind mm-hmm. of worked with some clients on this who, you know, in workouts, like, and this is before I knew anything about Ayurveda, like she would swear at herself and be so negative to herself. And I mm-hmm. said, you know, your body's listening, your body hears this, like you're, you're not going to get more out of yourself by putting yourself down so much. And so I ended up, you know, said, I'm like, every time you do that, um, you're going to do five burpees for me when I was there in person. And so she Mm -hmm. actually said she did that on her own and she did um, close to like 50 burpees. And that was her awakening in a sense to realize how negatively she spoke to herself Mm -hmm. in one hour. And so Mm -hmm. for her, that was her gateway to be like, I got to change because if I'm doing this during my workout, I'm probably doing it throughout my day. And so I'd be curious to hear what you thought about that too, of those stories that we maybe have on repeat and we tell ourselves, it really gets embedded in our body. Absolutely. Really. Our body tells the story at the end as well. It's uh, it's often, you know, the cause of disease. It's like, you know, doctors are discovering now that, you know, it's, it's the psychosomatic illnesses you know where they they're doing blood tests nothing's showing up you know in in a patient and they're asking why you know i'm giving them this medication and it's not working and um but actually the client has a really tough time and i feel that that's where we come in as ayurvedic practitioners we're that bridge to spend time with the client and ask them, you know, what's going on with you today? You know, like what's really at the heart of why you're feeling this way? And it could be family issues, the way that family upsets them, you know, things that they they just need to talk about. And so 
talk therapy is number one, um, a, a way to allow for someone to actually get that stuff out and have that um, ear to lean on. And that's kind of what we do in a lot of the sessions. I do either the moon sessions or the pod calls because that's where we see the stumbling blocks, what's holding us back, what's keeping that energy stuck where we can't move forward. And although I'm not a therapy, a therapist, I'm a, an, a transformational coach. So that helps me to bring people a little bit further on with, you know, their self image, their self worth. Because often that is the the very root of it, as you said with your client, it's how we talk to ourselves, it's how we think about ourselves, it's the stories that we live in, the old stories that carry so much. And so Ayurveda says, you know, these stories can go back 10 years, they stay in the body, they stay stuck in the tissues of the body. And so it's about rewriting those stories living and choosing different um, activities throughout our day so that we can rewire new neuro pathways that are more healthier for us that have carry that carry the habits that show us that we care for our body that bring us into this different state and different mode where we get to ask ourselves, who am I being right now? Where do I want to place my attention? And if people are listening and they're thinking, you know, oh, you know, social media is a big stumbling block for me. I love to kind of ask other Ayurvedic practitioners who do share on social media, you know, like, how do you manage that and help maybe clients who really are starting to be like, I'm having a problem, like I'm getting sucked into that world. And, you know, my five minutes of scrolling is now 20 minutes and they just have trouble shutting down and then they leave feeling worse about themselves. Like how do you personally navigate that and maybe work through people? Um, Cause I know that's just, that's just a big one in the reality of our world and where it is. And I have talked to other business owners and they're like, how, mm -hmm. how can I find that balance of like, I need to show up because I got to show people, yep, lights are on. I'm in business, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then not get sucked into it myself. Or then they get into their own feels. And I would, I just love hearing, how do you deal with that yourself? Yeah, I think um, my own personality is that I've, I've always told myself the story is that I'm not addicted to anything. Nothing's mm -hmm. going to have an addiction over me. You know, I'm, I'm the master of my own home here. And so I, I've, I've always been able to kind of dabble in things, but not get too sucked in it's like okay that's enough and just leave it and i think um it's like you know coffee some people say oh it's bad for you it's terrible for you and other people just like oh yeah this is um you got antioxidants it's great for me and it works for me but the problem is with like a, any addiction the yes uh, one cup is enough you know, one cup is is um, all your body needs, but then it's when you go over that into an asapmia, meaning non-healthy relationship with that object of your attention, that you become, you know, it becomes a, a ha an unhealthy habit. So we have to come back to what is nourishing. We have to come back to, you know, um, one out of s seven days, I can do this. Um, but then the rest of the days, I'm going to give more attention to reading a book, listening to some music, going for a walk in nature and finding that alternative, you know, cooking a nourishing meal. Th these are the things that are the nourishing, the satmya type of activities that 
you know, feel good at the end of the day, more so than, you know, looking and scolding. So it's the value that we put on the habits that we we choose. Um, and I think when you're aware of, you know, when you've done your meditation and you feel fantastic afterwards, and you take a note of that, and you celebrate the fact that yes, I showed up on my mat and yes, I'm feeling great and I'm feeling ready for the day. When you notice how good you feel, that's how you can then do more of it and say, no, I'm gonna put aside, you know, more time for doing the things that make me feel great. And just a dabble of, you know, the things that don't really leave me feeling fulfilled basically at the at the end of the activity yes that's great mm -hmm. and I wrote down the line that you said as you know the value we put on the habits that we choose I think that's such a great a great line and I think that's something that if people can come back to over and over again that's you know hey am mm -hmm. I doing this is this the value I'm choosing and you know some days yeah this is what I need right now and other mm -hmm. days you're like oh actually no I probably should just go outside and you know, get some fresh air and some sunshine. So thank you for that. Um, I want to know now kind of shifting into, you know, one last topic kind of with the nervous system. And this is one that I would say since probably since 2020, I've had more people reach out about sleep issues and insomnia mm -hmm. and struggle falling asleep. I don't know if that's something that you've noticed, but I've talked to other people in the health field and that's been a common complaint for many people. Um, what are your suggestions? Let's start with, you know, if people are having trouble falling asleep, we'll start with that one. Is there anything, you know, hormonally that you notice going on, or is it more of, you know, Hey, our nervous system isn't settled, or maybe they've been on screens too much. What are, what are some trends that you're seeing there? Yeah, I can, I can, I can see that, um, and hear my clients in what you've just described <laughs> for sure. Um, there's there is this you know almost tragic um addiction that we have with social media where you know we're not realizing that there's anything out of that realm and fortunately i mean i live right next to um a beautiful forest so really there's like no excuse for me not to find green spaces, but we all know the healing benefits from the Japanese study on green spaces and then how important it is for us to see green throughout the day. So whether that's like, you know, trees uh, or grassy meadows, it's important for us to be in that, you know, the, I think it's like 10 hours of the week, but if you're not hitting at least half an hour a day of green spaces and green, you know, being out in nature, then you're really missing out because it, it makes you feel so recharged. It's all got that prana, the life force energy. And so I always recommend to my clients, get out there every day, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, gold star, you know? and um be in nature because nature really is our is our healer she's she is what makes us um you know we're not we're not going out into nature we are part of nature and we're just bringing ourselves back into a state of being one with nature which i think is essential and i think anyone that's into ayurveda that's followed ayurveda that understands the five elements that are you know we are all part of you know um the internet and and um social media that's all the ether quality but we also need the other quality so when we have um you know been too much on a device it's good to ground by either putting your feet on the floor, barefoot, bare feet walking or hugging a tree or like just actually touching something that is earthy. And if you don't have, um, you know, a, a forest or green fields next to you, then you can do it also with 
foods that are also grounding um and this might be another reason it's so interconnected i'm that's why i'm just kind of like chuckling to myself because you know we're we're currently as a population we're we're quite malnourished we overeat a lot of food but the nourishment within the food this is also what's taking us away from that internal nature and feeling that one with that you know internal nature so it's about eating the right foods that are also going to be um, grounding and nourishing for us predominantly sweet taste is that grounding nourishing quality but when we're talking about sweets we're talking about you know honey the 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 maple syrups the um dates the dried fruits you know not a snickers bar let's say <laughs> you know we're talking about the whole foods the real foods um that that give us that grounding more like my breakfast this morning i'm currently on a cleanse and so i had uh, rice porridge with some almond milk which was really just like lovely and grounding and nourishing for the body but like um eating the foods that are warm uh, that are um, not going to aggravate vata dosha is also going to help protect your nervous system, not excessively drinking caffeine, because um, this also exacerbates any like nervousness and the difficulty with sleeping. And so, yeah, those those things really like focusing on the warm cooked foods for digestion, um, avoiding blue light, as we know, is also really important. And yeah, getting those nourishment, the nourishment that we need from our food. I love those tips. And would that help with insomnia for those who maybe are getting up at two or 3 a.m. and having trouble falling back asleep? Yeah, so um, that's, that's often you know, perimenopause can kind of bring that on um, where we get that like shoot of cortisol. Um, and that also could be because we're working too late. And so you kind of like look at those things together um, to see if they can shift and change um, what's happening in the body then. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And I'm as someone who hasn't slept through the night since gosh knows how long because of my one year old who still doesn't mm. sleep through the night. So I was like, oh, I, I am very used to getting up, but it is probably not fun. I mean, my body is adapted just because it's had to for the past year, but um, I am definitely looking forward to being able oh. to sleep through the night again. <laughs> Oh, and I will say it does take time because even the few nights that he has, like, usually he gets up between one and two. And it's so interesting just to see how, you know, my body is so habitual because he has been for a year getting up between one and two. So if he doesn't, he gets up at three 30 while well, I'm still up between by, by 2 AM, you know, cause my mm -hmm. body's like, Oh, you've got to get up because your little one has been. And so I'm, I know for me, this is going to be a beast to try to get myself to get sleeping all the way through the night again, just because this has been so habitual for, you know, getting up and nursing him and trying to get him back to sleep and that I'm yeah. not looking forward to. <laughs> oh, I know mothers, we, we really don't get any credits for, for how much we work we put in. We're 24 seven, aren't we? Yes. Yes. But I, I also believe that, um, a really good nighttime ritual, you know, where it's, where you kind of like start winding down by the latest eight, you know, no computers, you get your essential oils out, you go and have a bath, you go and have your like warm cup of milk and you get yourself into bed by 9.30, the latest. I don't know what time you go to bed. Are you an early bed? Yeah, early to bed? Yeah, I go to bed early just because, well, see, this is also where I like to be in bed typically by 9.30, but because he's been getting up, usually between 10 30 and 11 I'll find mm -hmm. myself like some nights I'm exhausted and I'll still get to bed but other nights I'm like well it's you know close to 10 I might as well just stay up and read until 
you know, he wakes up because I know he's going to wake up for the next half hour. So this is where my own habits just this past year, but I mean, that's, and then I'll, I'm of the age where I'm close to perimenopause too. So all yeah. of these things, and I have a ton of clients about my age who are having babies and just that, um, that cycle of like, how, how are we going to make this work, you know, with little ones and with perimenopause approaching. So that's where it gets a little, little dicey. Um, I will say, as I am recording this, um, we might have lost Amrita. So I am going to pause for just a second. All right. So we're back. All right. So I want to just kind of finish out um, by knowing where people can connect with you. And if people want to work with you, where can they find you? Well, thanks, Andrea. It's been really lovely speaking to you. So you can find me on Instagram as Ayurveda anytime. And I've also got a YouTube channel, which you can link to through the website, which is Ayurveda anytime. And currently I am sharing an Ayurvedic self care and cookery course. So I'm going to share with you all the things like how to prepare yummy foods um, with the remedies like herbal, different herbal remedies. And um, yeah, I just share with you some of the ways in which Ayurveda can help balance out your your constitution with the use of herbs and spices. Mm, I love it. Well, I just have one final question for you then. I always like to throw or end on a weekly challenge. Um, what would you like that challenge to be for everyone this week? I would love everyone to try to make a CCFT. So this is the coriander, cumin and fennel tea. And you add that um, one teaspoon of each of those spices to about four cups of water. You keep that in a flask and you sip that throughout the day so that you've got hydration and the herbs and spices that will help to stimulate your digestive fire, which also in turn reduces the amount of amatoxins in the body. Ooh, I love it. Yay. <laughs> I like, I enjoy CCFT and I know Banny Botanicals has, if someone doesn't like the just plain CCFT, Banny Botanicals has a good, I think it's called a heart opening one that I like, um, or rose there's, they have three different okay. varieties with a little extra, like mm. one extra herb. So if anyone wants it with a little twist, you can always add it with a little, I think rose might be one of them. Um, so I've got some here with some Tulsi added into the, yes. it tastes fantastic. Yes. I love it. So there's, you can <laughs> feel free to add your own little flair to it. So I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on Amrita and sharing your wisdom with us. Um, I enjoyed our conversation today. Yeah. It was wonderful to meet you and speak with you. Thank you so much. Andrea. Yeah. And everyone go out there and spread your peaceful power. <laughs>